uh, show pictures as nice as two previous speakers. Uh, and um, uh, this title is probably a bit too ambitious for what I'm going to present. So we are developing the unified theory. We have not developed it yet. So it's our attempt, it's our data collection, and our hypothesis formulation stage. Uh, this talk is based on two papers. One was published last year in uh, BMC Genomics, and um, one is going to be published at the end of this year in a book, uh, it's a chapter in the book DNA Methylation, and it's joint work with um, Ran and Haig. So, um, uh, those of you who are parents recognize this um, horrible picture, especially has a horrible sound. And um, so, if you're going fishing, you're collecting, uh, catching some fish, and uh, then let's imagine you uh, caught a lot. And uh, you found that maybe weight distribution of your fishes or lengths is um, having this um, distribution that is not Gaussian. So what are your thoughts? Of course, you try to think that probably there are different kinds of fishes, different species, and uh, they are coexist in the same pond. So the same thing happens when we look at um, genes. Um, if um, we actually stumbled upon this problem uh, quite by accident, when we were preparing our 2009 manuscript about corn transcriptome, we found that in uh, corn, distribution of um, uh, GC3 or G plus T in the third position of a codon has two modes. So uh, then at first we thought this might be a mistake uh, because in Arbidopsis we haven't observed any, any like that. Uh, but then we looked at other uh, species and found that it's actually, in fact, exists. And um, I thought we, for, uh, we thought it was probably a monocode specific effect. But then we looked at uh, onion apparently doesn't have it. And then we, um, when we narrowed down that uh, grasses have the effect, but actually, um, uh, and maybe um, humans have this effect, but we couldn't find any other species that were um, manifesting the same property. So our uh, 2010 paper was dedicated to bio GCC biology in grasses. So what is um, interesting about G and C pair uh, if you compare it to A and T pair. A and T pair has two hydrogen bonds, G C pair has three hydrogen bonds. But uh, this is chemistry, both as a consequences for biology. So um, if you um, compare uh, genes um, with a uh, low G C3 content and high G C3 content in uh, two organisms, rice and sorghum, you see um, the same uh, trend. So if you uh, look at genes that um, high end of spectrum, you get their intron less, and um, if you lower GC3 content, you get more high intron density. Another observation is related to gene uniqueness. And uh, there are two ways of looking at gene uniqueness. Uh, you can look at gene uniqueness, how many copies of gene exist in the same genome. And the second way of looking at is, is um, are there orthologs in other species? And actually, it is interesting in both cases. If uh, um, we look at um, how many paralogs, uh, if uh, GC3 is high, there is usually one copy of a gene uh, per genome, and uh, maybe multiple if you have a low G3 content. And a similar effect in uh, terms of comparison between organisms. Uh, we looked at rice. Distribution was nice and bimodal. If you look at those genes that are similar to dicot plant Arabidopsis, you see that uh, uh, the peak of low GC became much higher and uh, the high GC lower. But uh, if you look at uh, genes that are not similar, you get opposite effect. And actually, if you look at genes, it is not shown here, but they are uh, similar, all they exist only in rice and they don't have a counterpart in corn, but just very few of them, so not statistically significant, most likely they will be here. So we kept on looking. And our next um, exercise was to look at gene expression. And uh, we uh, went to NCBI Gene Omnibus, and we collected a little bit over 100 of RISE gene expression data sets. And uh, for each gene, we computed three uh, parameters. One parameter was GC3, second parameter was average expression of a gene, and the third parameter was standard deviation of gene expression. 
And in order to make our plots beautiful, uh, we uh, normalized and um, we compute these scores for all three measures. So what we observed, uh, if we plotted um, GC3 as a function of average expression, uh, what you get is uh, if uh, um, average expression is way below the average, GC3 tend to be higher. Uh, if you get uh, between um, plus minus one standard deviation around the average expression, you get negative trend. And if you get above one standard deviation, the trend becomes positive. So you clearly have uh, see different classes of genes. And, but the trend becomes much simpler and probably easier to interpret if you plot standard deviation of expression versus uh, GC3. So you get uh, linear dependence. And what you see that if um, uh, GC3 is low, then uh, expression is not variable. If GC3 is high, expression is variable. So high GC3 genes are variable in gene expression. And if genes are, are working all the time, like housekeeping genes, the probably GC3 is low. So, and because um, we found such a striking uh, effect, uh, difference um, if it's on uh, gene expression, um, we decided to look at transcriptional um, optimization, look at, the, um, at promoter organization. And um, in our earlier paper, published in uh, 2009, uh, we analyzed a uh, relationship uh, between the promoter organization and gene expression and existence of uh, data boxes. So uh, what we found is that if um, all genes are divided into six classes by gene expression, uh, zero, this has uh, lowest average expression, and five, highest average expression, and you plot position-specific frequency of um, uh, data box, you find that genes that on average have very low expression are more likely to have a data box. Uh, very highly expressed genes also have data box, but uh, genes expressed on average do not. So it's a sort of similar uh, three model, uh, three um, classes of genes. And uh, from the same paper, uh, we also tried to analyze uh, enrichment of g different uh, gene ontology classes with respect to data boxes. And if you look at the top of this table, uh, uh, because the table is arranged by uh, the enrichment in decreasing order. So uh, classes that are enriched in uh, data boxes are mostly those that are respond, uh, related to stress response. Oxidative stress, cold stress, different defenses. And if you look at um, protein folding and pro uh, protein amino acid phosphorylation, uh, these classes are depleted in data box. So uh, if you... Um, uh, look at then at the dependency between GC3 and data box. You look, uh, you find that there is also a correlation. So genes that have high GC3 are most likely to have data box. And if you look at two extremes, and um, if you take mm, genes that have GC3 below 0.45 and compare them to those at the other end of the spectrum above uh, 0.95 you get a huge difference in the uh, prevalence of data boxes. If you're uh, over here, 18%, over there, 52%. And uh, uh, if you um, look at gene ontology categories and the relationship between gene ontology and GC3, you find that two-thirds of stress-related genes have GC3 above 0.8. So it looks like that if genes are stress-related, uh, there are two things that they harbor. They harbor data boxes, and they also there is a drive towards having G and C or C in the third position in codons. So this was good. But now the question is, but where are those Gs and Cs? Are they uniformly distributed across uh, the uh, open reading frame, or they are in a certain positions? So, and again, the answer was different for different classes of genes. So if we divide, uh, again, just visually, because we have this camel shape into a lower uh, hump and upper hump, you will get uh, um, there, uh, uh, there's a gradient in GC3 and also in the CG skew. So if you look at the uh, high GC3 genes in, uh, for instance, rice and sorghum, you see that uh, 
frequency of GSC in a third position increases when you move away from ATG, from 5 prime to 3 prime But for low classes, you get maybe slight increase, but then general negative correlation. And uh, if you look at C minus G over G plus C in CG skew, you get even um, more peculiar picture. So first, you have an increase. Actually, in both of them, first increase, then decrease. But high GC3 genes are more C rich because C minus G is positive. In the low end of spectrum, low GC3 genes, uh, after uh, also going through this increase, they become more G rich than C rich. And um, what we decided to look at is only a property of uh, grasses that have bimodal distribution. So in order to uh, check this, we took 5% of uh, orbital opposite genes from both ends of spectrum. And of course, um, the uh, signal probably is not as pronounced, the kinks are not as high, but you can still see this, uh, there remains with the same tendency. So uh, in the high end of spectrum, you get a positive trend that levels off quite quickly, and you get also slight negative trend in the GC3 uh, content for the low GC3 genes, and uh, similar prevalence of Cs in the high GC3 genes and prevalence of Gs in the low GC3 genes. So this effect is probably um, much more universal than um, you would, uh, it's, not, it's not only for bimodal species. So what could be the explanation for the gradient? And I was really happy to uh, hear uh, this morning several talks um, about um, translational optimization and um, the influence of codon choices for protein folding because it looks like it all comes together and something that's actually missing from our analysis that we need to look at is uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the kinetic properties of uh, translation. Is um, uh, Because there were some studies um, that... Uh, indicating the choices of C's and G's in third position uh, actually um, uh, lead to increase of translation speed. And um, if you imagine a stress-related gene, the gene that has to be expressed under certain conditions, and uh, if you need to make maybe drought-related protein or salt-related protein, you have to make it fast because, you know, oh, you have to act now. And because of that, you cannot afford... Uh, ribosomal congestions or RNA polymerase bumping each other off, you need to um, accelerate from 5 prime to 3 prime in order to avoid abortive transcription and translation. And that will explain if C's and G's are uh, um, uh, related to the speed of those processes, it would make sense that uh, stress-related genes need uh, to have those processes optimized by uh, choosing the optimal codons. And um, one more way of um, looking at C's and G's, and this is not related to transcription, is uh, DNA methylation. We can look at um, uh, differences in the number of potential methylation targets. And the way we look at it, uh, for uh, two groups of genes, low GC and high GC, uh, we uh, calculated ratios of C, G, dinucleotide, to G, C. And um, what we found that there's absolutely profound differences for those two classes. So high GC3 genes have approximately equal number of CG and GC, but low class is centered about 0.5, so they are depleted in potential mutilation targets. So um, what will be our um, next goal in this mutilation analysis, we would like to actually look at mutilation arrays and actually see if there is a, um, um, experimental evidence for that. So uh, the next question is evolutionary. So if the G's and C's in the third position is in fact is, um, uh, uh, maybe can be explained by either horse, are genes maybe passive riders on the big chunks of um, DNA that enrich in C and G. And um, what we look at, it looks like it's probably not very likely and just looking at the rice genes, but we have to, of course, look at other organisms also. Uh, if you um, look at, um, if you divide uh, uh, promoters into those that have um, uh, uh, genes um, high in GC group or low GC group, you'll see the distribution of um, 
CG content of promoters um, is the same for both high and low groups, so they are not different. And another way of looking at it, if on the x-axis you plot uh, GC content and on the y-axis probability to be in the high GC3 peak, you see that promoter, if your promoter increases in uh, GC content, uh, actually it's probably even uh, becomes less likely, but it's probably not statistically significant, that the gene becomes um, uh, GC3 rich. If you look at the introns, the effect is opposite. So if you increase the uh, GC content of intron, the uh, corresponding gene is more likely to be in a high peak. And uh, the same effect is also for the coding for CG in a position one and two. So this curve, this pink curve is quite, is indicative that the effect is probably is on a transcriptional level. So here's a summary of what we found in our plant exercise. So these genes here, uh, they um, stress-related genes, uh, two-thirds of them have GC3 by 0.8. But overall, for, for entire genome, only one-third have uh, GC3 above 0.8. 50% uh, of Tata Plus genes have GC3 above 0.8. What else? There are more mutilation targets, variable gene expression, less introns. There are mostly unique genes, and uh, GC3 increases with distance from ATG. So this was our summary of uh, our uh, plant exercise. So what is a hypothesis? Probably it is related to some evolutionary advantage. And um, maybe because it's better linked to better probability of stress, maybe transcription and translation process are more optimized. Uh, in other way, it may be a uh, protein structure is uh, more optimal. And uh, if you imagine that there is only one copy of a gene per genome, or a gene that is unique to species, that's one that uh, differentiates and is responsible for speciation, you would like to make sure that this gene is expressed, the protein is made, and that's why it, it needs to have to be uh, transcriptionally optimized. But now let's look outside of plant world. And this, uh, uh, this joint work, it's a work in progress uh, with Iran and Haig. So um, uh, I got uh, this data from Aaron because he was also working in the same area. And um, uh, what he did, uh, he um, extracted a high quality transcript from a chicken, cow, fish, human, mouse, rat, and pig. And uh, we plotted uh, GC3 and what we found that there are three um, absolutely confidently bimodal species. And it is a uh, human, uh, pig, and uh, cow. Chicken is probably bimodal or probably not, because it sort of has a, a sort of slight uh, kink. And uh, fish is uh, definitely not, and uh, uh, rat and mouse are also not bimodal. So you see that uh, bimodality exists on different branches of evolutionary tree, and it doesn't really correspond to evolutionary distance between species. So, uh, but now let's look at um, uh, transcriptional effects in, um, in uh, animals. So if you look at mouse, and this also from our old paper from 2009, you see that a relationship between promoters' organization and expression is uh, the same as we saw in Arabidopsis. So probably we can uh, try to use same methods that we used for our plant analysis while looking at animals. Now let's look at first on methylation targets. Here we have chicken, here we have human. And the same difference between high GC3 genes and low GC3 genes. Now let's look at um, a five prime, a three prime uh, gradient of CG3. And for chicken, for cow, we have very similar uh, pictures, very similar to what we saw in plants. Uh, slightly noisier data uh, that we have for uh, uh, CGSQ, but we see the same for human and for mouse. So another thing that's basically, this was an email I got from Iran just last night, and um, 
uh, his uh, recent idea to explain uh, the digital gradient is by work of repeat elements. What he did, uh, he uh, ran a repeat masker on um, a human genome, and he discarded all hits uh, that were uh, too, um, very too, too far from the gene. Uh, his idea that uh, um, rep uh, different repeat elements that are able to deliver uh, some pieces of uh, DNA and insert them in different parts of a gene, either a five prime or three prime end. And if you look at um, um, the correlations between um, uh, GC3 uh, condom of the gene and actually uh, GC3 condom in the five prime end, middle portion of all three prime end, uh, and uh, stratified by different repeat families, you will to see um, either the correlation or not, and uh, try to determine if um, uh, repeat elements is, um, is responsible. So if you look at across all repeat elements, we can see no correlation. But different group of repeat elements, family, uh, different families, have preference for um, insertion in different positions. So and, uh, the correlations are, uh, most of them, quite statistically significant, they are less than uh, uh, 10 to the negative 3. So um, probably, we have not looked at um, this data closely yet, because it's basically it's, it's, that was like last night results, but it's, it looks quite optimistic. So uh, probably uh, repeat elements may be at fault for driving the GC3 content. So now the big summary. So what is responsible for uh, the modulation of the GC3 uh, content? The current idea that's most likely effect is combined. So um, we can imagine that probably was an effect of horizontal gene transfer that brought a high GC3 gene into organism. And then it proved to be evolution advantageous because it gave some transcriptional advantage. And maybe methylation and transcriptional optimization go hand in hand to stabilize and to maintain this effect. And uh, maybe um, repeat elements were somehow at fault for bringing this in. And uh, Dennis Murphy from the University of Glamorgan recently came up with a very interesting explanation uh, why we observe uh, effect in certain species. So um, let's look at the evolutionary tree. So we find that in uh, humans, not in rodents, not in mouse, not in human, not in, in rat, in uh, cow, in pig, m m probably in chicken, in um, grasses, not in uh, the rest of the monocots, and not in dicots. What, is, um, what can be inferred from the species that are marked with a green star? So uh, grasses, in different forms like seeds or just grass, are eaten by those species, and a human also eats them. And human also eats grass. What do we give back to nature? So we give back feces. So probably, uh, due to the enormous amount of flesh and cows and actually the amount of manure produced, uh, there is a way of a horizontal gene transfer and making a stable loop. I don't um, think that's a very good theory, and for the reason that if there is a horizontal gene transfer and a gene exchange between all those organisms, then a genetically modified uh, food is going to be prohibited. But, uh, so, that's a Dennis Murphy's hypothesis, I'm not responsible for that. So, uh, manure aside, how can we use the GC3 um, uh, uh, theory? And in order to do it, um, you can go to poster number I04 that's going to be presented tomorrow by Vasilis Christaris. And um, uh, this method incorporates uh, properties of GC3 genes because of what we found that different types of genes have a uh, different probability to have data box or not to have data box be GC high or GC low. So different genes have different organizations, so we can expect different things from them. So uh, Vasilis has built a model to predict a transcription start site based on different evidence, and GC3 content is one of them. So um, this is a, now a closing slide. So my collaborators are Nick Alexander, John Book, Ken Feldman, uh, Iran Hayek, and Dennis Murphy from uh, different uh, universities all over the world. And um, my graduate students and uh, glaucoma bio were patient years when I was uh, practicing this talk. And I would like to thank Research Investment Scheme at the University of Glamorgan for paying for my trip here and uh, 
thank to um, ISMB and ECB organizers for allowing me to present this talk, and thank you for the audience for the listening. <laughs>